Krasner here. Very excited to be talking with my guests. Today, I am the host, uh, and we're talking about generative AI in healthcare, uh, more affectionately known as healthcare AI for dummies. We're here to break it down. We're here to talk about all the sizzle in the industry today, and we're here to get an expert opinion on what's really happening in healthcare AI um, at the grassroots on the delivery side. I'm here with two very well-known people in the industry. Um, Lee, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your background. Sure, Missy, and great to be here with you and my friend, Sara. I'm the Chief Digital Health Officer at the Yale New Haven Health System and the Yale School of Medicine, where I'm also the Associate Dean of Digital Strategy and Transformation. And in my other life, I'm a stroke neurologist, and I'm also a Professor of Neurology and also Bioinformatics and Data Sciences here at Yale, and super excited to be here. Love it. Sara, everybody knows you. I feel like I follow you around the conference circuit. I'm constantly kind of in your in your wake. Um, for those that may be new to you, tell us a little bit about your background. Thanks, Missy. And, you know, Lee always uh, makes the rest of us look bad. So I, <laughs> I serve as the chief strategy officer and the chief digital officer at Providence. Um, and, uh, you know, we're a large uh, integrated delivery network up and down the Western United States. And I have responsibility for what I would call sort of like the front end of the system in terms of how we present ourselves to our communities through our marketing, our digital and um, our experience uh, sort of efforts. And um, and we are really trying to make a much more uh, not just consumer friendly, but, you know, person oriented system through all the work that we're doing. And just before, just, just to get to know a little bit more about your systems, because I want to, I want the listeners to really understand sort of like the breadth and the scope of your systems. Um, Lee, why don't you just tell us a little bit about like, you know, I know, I know a little bit about where you work and what your system is, but for our listeners, the scope of what, what it is. Yeah. So uh, Yale New Haven Health System is an integrated delivery network. <clears throat> it's anchored by the Yale New Haven Hospital, which is the, the major teaching affiliate of the Yale School of Medicine. Um, it has a bunch of additional uh, community-based hospitals all around the state of Connecticut and one in Rhode Island. The uh, provider base includes employed specialists through the School of Medicine, hospitalists, primary care docs, and others through the health system, and then a large number of private physicians who still make use of those inpatient facilities to deliver care, uh, perform surgeries, et cetera. We are fortunate to be on a single instance of Epic across our entire organization, which has some challenges of executing at scale, but is remarkable in the integrated nature of our enterprise data warehouse and our ability to deliver things quickly to scale because we're only operating over one instance. Referral management, you know, digital front door, those become hmm. simpler tasks, not to say that we've executed perfectly by any means, but we have that one advantage that I think is really interesting. The other is that the population we serve, anchored again as we are in New Haven, is very diverse and very representative of the US population as a whole. So we have a combination of both safety net, academic medical center, community hospital care, that also represents really terrific opportunity as we think about turning data into evidence into practice. Excellent. Sara, you're a, a very large system with lots of lots of geography. Tell us a little bit about uh, how large Providence is. Yeah, and some common themes actually uh, to what Lee just described as well. So we are also integrated. We uh, span seven states uh, from Alaska through Washington, Oregon, California, Texas, New Mexico, and Montana. And uh, we operate over 50 hospitals, a thousand ambulatory sites. We've got about a... Um, a broad uh, sort of clinical network of uh, about 25,000 employed and affiliated clinicians, uh, doctors, and then, you know, uh, 45,000 nurses. I mean, it's just a massive system. Um, and, but similar to what, uh, what Lee was describing with respect to Yale, we've made a lot of investments in our technology infrastructure over the last several years. We are also, um, we are, uh, we have a unified Epic uh, environment. We are um, on a cloud-based ERP. So uh, a lot of our data is now accessible. It's in the cloud. It's um, uh, we've made 
pretty significant investments in our data platform in terms of the, the platform itself, but also the quality of the data, the de-identification of the data, and um, our ability to utilize it for a variety of sort of business and clinical use cases. So we've been on this multi-year sort of infrastructure journey. We've also made a lot of investments on the, again, more kind of consumer side of things so that we can um, have, an, uh, you, you know, bring things to scale a little bit more easily as opposed opposed to having to deal with, you know, dozens or hundreds of applications and, and that kind of thing. I mean, it's a never ending kind of body of work, but um, through the combination of what our CIO has done, what our virtual care group has done and what the digital team has done, we've really started to um, build an infrastructure and a set of uh, data systems that uh, we can actually use um, and build a build or partner um, with AI solutions. Um, so uh, so we can actually start to get some value out of them. And, you know, I just want to jump on something that, that Sarah said a couple of times with that word consumer. Um, I think where I've evolved in my thinking around this is that we really want to be informed by consumerism, but we are not making, we're not a consumer goods company. There isn't transparent pricing. There isn't readily available information about all the products. You don't really know what you're buying. So it's not truly capable of being a consumer market, but our patients are consumers of many other things and their expectations around healthcare and their willingness to tolerate the opacity that has characterized healthcare consumption and delivery. I think that patience is wearing thin. And so we all in this community feel a compelling need for greater transparency, ease of navigation, convenience, costs, you know, price sensitivity. And for the first time in my 30 plus years in healthcare, I think we're on the verge of a major transformation with large language models and how they have democratized what it means to ask questions and get answers without having to be a computer programmer. I, I think we're really, this is probably as profound as, you know, the printing press in terms of the capacity for information to be communicated in ways that people can consume. I mean, a lot of people are saying this is this this is a huge technology sea change. Uh, change. It's on the order of of you know the the personal computer and or the the iPhone, the the mobile phone, uh, having a computer in your pocket. Um, I think just for our guests, let's just roll it back. Let's talk about sort of traditional AI or machine learning versus generative AI. Um, you know, Lee, you were just jumping right in and talking about large language models. Um, let's sort of just kind of do a, a quick kind of level setting on our vocabulary so that our listeners can kind of follow us today when we, we, we talk about real life use cases and uh, we talk about the applications of generative AI. So uh, I don't know if, if Lee, you want to jump in or Sarah, you want, one of you guys want to sort of say, hey, here's the way that I think about traditional which, you know, being someone who's worked at Amazon and Google and in and, and big tech for a really long time, this isn't a new concept, right? Like there are some, there is a tremendous amount of newness around the generative piece, but yeah. even NLP and customer service chatbots have been around for a really long time. So Missy, I'll, I'll like, I'll tee it up and then Sarah can dunk it into the basket. Yeah. Um, I think, I think about these really into like three big buckets robotic process automation, machine learning, and generative AI. And robotic process automation to me is rule-based business processing. Yep. So it's invoicing, it's prior auth, it's a lot of routine tasks that someone is doing manually or semi-manually now, and we can really just get that off of their queue and let them work on more complex transactions. I was doing machine learning in high school because logistic regression is the simplest form of, uh, you know, of a machine learning neural network algorithm, right? So Prediction's been around forever. Yep. Um, what's gotten more sophisticated is the ability of that technology to work on different types of unstructured data, speech recognition, some of the predictive analytics we have using structured and unstructured data to allow us to predict future states. That's really different than analyzing in reverse, in retrospect with biostatistical methods to say, what were the factors that most likely predicted who had a good outcome from this treatment? We know the outcome, and now we're looking back and saying, what were the factors that predicted it? Predictive analytics say, I'm going to predict the future, and I'm going to say, what's going to happen next? Like, finish your sentence with the next word. Generative AI is really creating novel information and synthesizing lots of prior examples, finding patterns, and then predicting 
you know, like my, my wife and I tease each other, but I know her so well I can finish her sentences. Like that's generative AI, but now it's not just um, pictures, it's voice, it's behavior, it's text, it's images, it's videos. If you saw the, the latest release yep. uh, of, the, of this platform where you put a sentence in, you get a 30 minute, 30 second video, like it's, it's really like blowing us all out of the water. Where we're gonna dive in first and deeply is around this ambient listening and note documentation, which I can talk about later yep. in the call as like the first real payday for actual frontline providers for how this AI is going to actually make their life easier. Sarah? Uh, you know, I think uh, Lee described the difference between sort of the uh, classic and the generative and the creation of new things um, rather than just predicting. Um, and I think one of the, you know, sort of one of the underlying difference th differences there is that classic AI was much more deterministic. Um, and generative AI is much more probabilistic. So the same inputs don't necessarily, you know, in a probabilistic model, you're going to get a distribution or you're going to get some set of outputs within a range. And hopefully that range doesn't, uh, you know, sort of drift or change over time. And so you're going to, but you are going, it's much more probabilistic. Um, and I, I think there are also a few other things about uh, generative AI relative to classic AI that are that are different. The performance of uh, you know transformer-based LLMs is fundamentally better <laughs> than the old school classic you know uh, uh, classic machine learning models that were deterministic. Uh, and, and we see that performance in every dimension, uh, whether it's image recognition, language recognition and understanding, you know, all of the uh, all of these types of things, they actually now exceed human performance. Um, and and in particular, you know, um, in the last like you know, seven to eight years, that's where we've seen this huge inflection point when it comes to performance. So from a performance perspective, um, we are, you know, and the examples that folks have seen is uh, some language model, large language model was able to pass the United States medical licensing exam, or they're able to identify sort of things in images like radiological images that human beings couldn't and so on and so forth. Those are examples of how the performance is different um, and better. Um, the, the democratization that Lee highlighted is also a major difference, which is driving much more adoption. So the democratization, I mean, the beauty and the genius, it was like this, such, a, such a simple yet, you know, a, a simple and elegant um, thing that OpenAI did when they introduced ChatGPT to the commoners out here, you know, the rest of us, um, was that when they released it on November 30th of 2022, they put a, a simple chat interface in front of it or a search interface in front of it. And that completely opened up everybody's imagination and resulted in um, ChatGPT becoming the fastest adopted consumer technology of all time. Um, and so that's also, you know, capturing folks' imagination and translating into adoption in other domains um, as well. And so, and then we've got that combined with this sort of probabilistic aspect to it, which requires a completely different way of thinking about how you govern, how you put guardrails around these things. You know, like we're just seeing a, a whole new world. Um, and in many ways, um, along sort of the path of getting to uh, general artificial intelligence, um, uh, we are, we're starting to need, see the needs to kind of govern this stuff like we govern humans, because it affects every little aspect of what we do. And so those are, I think, some of the big differences. And then that kind of leads me to sort of this next question, which is, you know, I, I think there's a, there's sort of a, a big debate right now about, um, you know, how you use these, these, these large language models, they could be more focused, smaller language models that are very discrete to healthcare and healthcare languages and or codes. Um, and, you know, we often hear, we often hear sort of the terms of language model, or we hear co-pilots or agents, we're hearing a lot of that. Um, and in my world, I sort of think of a co-pilot as a fully formed app, you know, sort of, if you, if you don't want to, if you don't want to take advantage of programming something yourself, you've got you know, you've got functionality already at your fingertips and you're sort of taking advantage of, of, of a language model, uh, either large or something that is your own data. And you've got a, a sort of an appified experience of how you're doing uh, queries and answers. 
um, and it can be augmenting your workflow. I think the debate right now in healthcare is, you know, what are the shovel ready use cases? And are they more workflow and back office or are we ready for prime time? Are we really ready for clinical care? Are we ready to have artificial intelligence in, in, in the, on the clinical side? And we're seeing great companies like Hippocratic AI who are fully focused on, a, on an agent that's trying to replace a nurse um, versus a lot of other shovel ready use cases on the payer side that are just doing prior off. that are doing, you know, member eligibility. Yeah. So jump in late. So Missy, I think there's, there's a couple of really important points in there that I want to dive into. And I think um, there's some nuances even within that. So back office, not even ready for prime time, yesterday's prime time, you're seeing that flood everywhere. That's just going to happen. It's going to ring efficiency. It's going to probably have some impact on, you know, jobs and workforce, you know, size and composition. Um, I think by and large, that's just going to be table stakes and everyone's going to do that piece. And a lot of the traditional vendors are just going to infuse their products with AI to make them better. I think when we talk about clinical care, and I want to dig into this co-pilot concept a little bit and point out some potential fallacies in that co-pilot model, we're really talking about a tool that is designed to inform the provider, often physician, sometimes nurse or other, to make a good choice. So it's really like whispering in your ear over your shoulder, but it's not doing the job instead of you. That's how most of the companies are pushing their products. And in part, that's to avoid being regulated as software as a medical device or other more stringent requirements. But I wanna point out um, some, some uh, research that's been published recently that really calls into question whether we can ever truly have just a co-pilot. Because we have uh, this uh, computational sort of automation bias, humans do. When, you, when you're told that it's a machine that produced this answer, you are very strongly influenced by that framing. Mm -hmm. uh, the example I give that's really simple is, if, if I ask you how much is you know, 15 times 723 and someone uses a calculator, you're gonna trust that answer over your own pretty much un unless something really weird is going on, right? You have an automation bias. Yeah. So they did a study at Emory um, actually, there's a couple of different studies. Let me focus on a different one first. They did a study looking at radiologists reading breast images, so mammograms. And there's a four-point rating scale uh, called BIRADS that rates the severity of the likelihood of malignancy. And when they gave an expert system that was acting as designed to three groups of readers, inexperienced, moderately experienced, and experts, the technology made all three level up pretty much to the level of experts, amazing. But then they did something different. They deliberately programmed the, the AI to give the wrong answer. Hmm. And sure enough, the inexperienced reader does terribly, right? Because they're, they're just following the machine around. They don't know what they're doing. But the expert rater performance dropped by almost 50%. Wow. Because the experts said, oh, wait a minute. I thought it was a four, but the thing is saying a three. Maybe it is a three. Maybe, I, maybe I'm over-interpreting that. So there's a huge bias there that we can't get around. Yeah. So let's be really thoughtful. And in a separate experiment, looking at a chest X-ray to say whether it was heart failure, pneumonia, or COPD, emphysema, even when you hotspot the area in the image that the AI is basing its recommendation on, and you show a completely bogus hotspot, like the sternum, when you're looking at the lungs, didn't make a difference. Explainability did not diminish that impact of an expert system giving you bad advice. So I think we just need to be cautious that as we embrace these technologies, the advice is always gonna be more influential than we perhaps intend it to be. So that was the middle thing. The third piece of this is that I think where, where you're really gonna see shovel ready and where a lot of these diagrams of you know, feasibility versus value and all that, top of the pyramid, top of that pyramid is documentation burden. Sure. And using AI as a virtual scribe to really dig into that. And that's one of the things that we are uh, just about to implement as an enterprise solution. And we have really high hopes for this based on our colleagues experience who are a little bit ahead of us. And I followed this field for like six years. Every six months, I dip my toe in and see what's happening and try to get a demo and see where this thing is. And it was vapor, 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 vapor. Interesting works only in like one really narrow indication with really strict, you know, vocabulary constraints. And then about a year ago, it was like, whoa. And then about six months ago, it was, oh my God. But and I think we're in an, oh my this God is, moment. This is, this is, I mean, we've had, we've had 
dictation for we've had dictation tooling for a really long time. Yeah. This is ambient. This is this is smart. Yeah, this is not during, this is not voice dictation like you you know you talk yeah, to yeah, Siri yeah. and and uh, and she sends a text message. This is listen to an entire conversation, right. sort out that there are multiple parties involved, digest the information, right. predict what is really being spoken in that conversation, and then produce it in the format of a formal office consultation note yeah. with everything parsed into the buckets that it needs to be. It's really transformative. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, Microsoft and Nuance have been running at this for a while. Even when I was at Amazon, you know, when we we released AWS Comprehend Medical and we were looking at how applications of Alexa and we were doing really kind of fun things with Providence, everybody was running after this. I think this is going to be highly commoditized, but it is the first, like, holy grail. I mean, Sara, what's your take on this? I know you've you've been looking at the ambient dictation space or note taking. Uh, you know, however you want to you want to you want to sort of put a label on it. Yeah, I think, you know, um, the way Lee described it, I, I think is right. I mean, um, we broke it out into four categories, the work that we were doing. The first category was anything that was patient um, and consumer facing, focused primarily on sort of self-serve navigation and personalization. I think there are some shovel ready examples there in particular um, on the navigation side of things and term and navigation and self-serve side of things. Um, and we're seeing, I mean, we've, we've built a homegrown solution that performs like has very, um, very high performance, um, akin to like an agent in some cases better. Um, and, uh, and it is, um, you know, it surfaces up in the form of a chat bot. Like that's the interface with, with the, the patient. So that is shovel ready. Um, and it's part, you know, we have that in place on the consumer side of things, um, combined with a clinical side of things that is an in-basket management service um, that allows for an in-basket mass uh, message. So for folks that don't know, clinicians uh, receive essentially like emails, right? Or ma messages from their patients um, when every time you go messages into- Messages with an S at portal, the end, like hundreds per day or per hour. Oh yes, um, exactly. I mean, we 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 get about seven. Our our clinicians get seven hundred thousand messages per month, um, and and so it's just an astronomical number. And um, our team uh, are, in fact, you know, our teams have come together across the organization on the in basket messaging side of things to um, read those messages, understand the intent combine that intent with clinical context from the record and then auto draft a message and and that combined with a self-serve use case before a message is even generated um it has had tremendous impact on um on our system we are why, why wouldn't epic just develop that feature on their own or any or cerner or any even any of the ambulatory ehrs they just yeah. on the trail so it's a to do that it's a great question. Um, so, you know, they're not trying to get upstream to prior to the message being generated. So that's one area where they're not even really playing right now. And what we've seen is that for folks that do engage with our bot prior to a message being generated, there's a 30% reduction in messages mm -hmm. generated, like just right off the bat. Yeah, like then on the yeah, like someone oh, go wants ahead, to Lee. request a refill for their medicine. That's not an in-basket yeah. message. That's a refill request. Exactly. Redirect that so there's a different work, right. for example. example. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and then on the actual in basket sort of triaging messaging side, of, you know, message uh, reduction side of things, um, what we've so why not go with Epic? Epic or, or, or Cerner, a lot of these solutions, what they want to do is, in fact, um, uh, basically route everything through the patient portal in basket messaging that yeah. they do. And in some cases, that's not the right mechanism. And it can actually take quite a lot of computing power. So for instance, they might want to put every single message through GPT-4. And that's not needed. Imagine like, you know what we get? We get a lot of folks sending messages that say thanks. Yeah. You don't need <laughs> that to go through GPT-4 and for it to cost you 12 cents every single time that that message is going through, right? So there are different ways to handle it. And um, you only want the really, uh, you want the complex stuff. You want the stuff that really needs to, you want the message to go to the right place 
for the right use case and handled in the appropriate way. And for us, like the, for after the message is generated, um, we've seen a uh, having so from 48 hours to 24 hours for response time. So we know that our, our providers are able to get to those messages faster because um, because of the support, the augmentation, the assisting in the augmentation. That, that You're getting providing. rid of low value care. That's the thing. Yes. You're getting rid of me spending my very expensive time looking at something that I never should have had to look at in the first place. And that prioritization doesn't really exist in Epic very much or in these other EHRs other than maybe a little exclamation point next to a folder that might have an important message. But I, when I look at my email, I can scan the subject and the first line, and I can pick out the ones that need my attention first. So the kind of work that Sarah's talking about is really important to reducing the cognitive load on providers, not yeah. just the actual time spent. I mean, I would imagine that it's definitely something that, that I mean, and there's a lot of, uh, I, I would imagine that's something that many of the, the incumbent EHRs in, in the acute care space are going to work on because I think it just makes them more competitive. And, um, you know, it'll be a buyer build for them, Missy. I think that some of this stuff, they're just going to, they're just going to part. I mean, look at Epic, right? They picked Nuance and they picked a bridge to be like internal, internal partners, right? Cause there there's places they're going to go and some places that they're not. I think the other space that's really interesting around what, what Sara was saying is, letting conversational AI sit on top of your call centers yes. and just start to learn. Why are people calling? What is it that they wanna do? Yeah. And can you then start giving them options up front with a bot before they speak to an agent? Can you drive them to a bot? I don't know if you've seen this, but the postal service of all places has done something really interesting when you wanna forward your mail. Yeah. They have this hybrid experience where you call on the, you call on the phone and then it sends you a link and it drives you to a website where it monitors how you're making your way through the form and guides you to success. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think this concept of, it's also not gonna be just bot. It's gonna be a bot plus a human, plus the web, yeah. plus something else, plus your past behavior. And I think we're gonna see the biggest success is gonna be in those hybrid experiences and the place this is ripe for is patient navigation to the right care provider and pre-charting. So Missy, you're gonna come see me as a neurologist. You already had to wait three months to get an appointment, right? You know what your problem is and you know what, the, what you're looking for. Why hasn't an, an AI solution interviewed you for 25 minutes before you even show up, yep. characterize the nature of your problem, recommended the right specialist, and then aggregated before your visit the most relevant practice guidelines and clinical research opportunities that are relevant to you before I even open your record at our visit, right? That is just ripe. What, one thing I would, I would just add to what Lee said and go back even a little bit to like the previous question, which is what are the shovel ready use cases? Shovel ready, like the technology itself has infinite potential in a, in a manner of speaking. Now I would, I would say that is true. And also it is true that the availability of enterprise grade LLMs and generative AI based solutions is relatively limited. And that's not because of the possibilities of the technology, but it's because of all the other things that are required to make a technology um, useful. Yes. Exactly. And so for instance, you know, most of the time when we're deploying these types of things, it's not with an AI native workflow in mind. It's just slapping it on top of like the same old crappy process that you had, right? Or, you know, sort of like retrofitting it um, on the back end. Or it's, um, you, you know, we don't necessarily think about the um, all the processes at the build, at the deployment, at the post deployment, at the, you know, ongoing kind of maintenance phase that ne are needed to do testing and validation that are needed to do monitoring that are needed to do telemetry. Those are the things that make it really tricky. And, and so that's the, that's the really hard part is, um, you know, they could do a 30 minute interview with you. I mean, take the e-check-in example, which isn't even a fancy LLM based thing, right? You could do e-check-in, but how often do you go into your clinic and then they ask you the same question? All over again. Yeah. Even <clears throat> Epic has a very nifty e-check-in 
uh, that's sponsored, sponsored on the MyChart platform. And, you know, I think they, you have to take several strides to answer that questionnaire. And yeah, it's not connected into the main workflow of the office staff for sure. You know, the, the analogy I would give is it's like when the, you know, the 14 year old prodigy goes to university, you know, instead of going to high school, right? There's, you know, in math class, they're like ahead of the class. They're genius. They're doing all this amazing stuff. And then they get invited to sit in the lunchroom. They don't know where to sit. And they have a panic attack. The, the, these LLMs have so much power and potential, but they're a little bit like a bull in a china shop sometimes in actual clinical workflows. We don't have the governance processes, but we also don't have the, the transparency algorithms and the ethical kind of standards that we're going to have to insist on before we deploy these things. That, that stuff is just starting. There's some great collaborative organizations like Chai, Valid AI, Train. There's a whole bunch of these that are recognizing that there's a big void between I got this snazzy algorithm that can actually predict with really high accuracy who's going to have kidney failure in the next three years, but is it actually hold up in real world practice? We do phase four studies after a drug is approved to make sure that it's getting the results that it should when it's released into the real world. Yeah. We're going to need to set up that kind of infrastructure for these tools because they are really going to start taking big chunks of work out of the hands of people who have typically been delivering and monitoring them. And don't get me wrong, our human system of delivering medical care is very flawed and has all sorts of breakdowns and variations in quality. We can do a better job with this stuff. We just have to make sure that we're doing the best job for everybody and that we're not systematically doing a worse job in some people over and over again because we now have an algorithm in charge of this stuff. So I think that's a that's a piece that can't be overemphasized. It's super interesting. There was a meme on social media for a while. I don't know if you guys caught it. Um, I think there was a, a Tesla sales call entirely, and you guys probably heard it, right? Australian voice salesperson's getting on and doing a follow-up call with someone who signed up for a test drive in one of the local retail stores and was just saying, hi, I'm so forth. I'm calling because you signed up. I'd love to talk to you about scheduling a test drive. Full conversation, full AI generated voice with a, with a lovely and enticing accent. Um, I think, you know, we're used, we're used to IVR systems. We're, you know, the payers have had uh, triage and IVR for some time. They're, they're, they're very decision tree based and not great. And it's, everybody wants to pass go and hit zero and, and, and get to an operator. I think, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about care management, you're thinking about care coordination, you're thinking about follow-up after post-discharge, all kinds of ways in which we're using humans and call centers now and nurses and or care coordinators or social workers to follow up with people. Um, you know, there's a whole new way that you can do that in an AI, kind of with an AI chassis, but, you know, uh, it's a delicate walk, right? Because healthcare is high touch. It is human. There is a lot of cultural authority given to clinicians um, in, in, in an interactive visit. But yeah, the digital front door, collecting information and or a, a, a post-visit follow-up is really interesting sort of use cases where I do think you can get efficiencies and you're essentially you know, taking down your call center capital costs and you might be doing it in a much more delightful way. Well, well Missy, imagine, imagine the concept of you come to see Dr. Schwamm, you have your surgery and your post visit follow-up is a deep faked cloned voice of Dr. Schwamm reading you out personalized post-discharge recommendations. You're gonna be much more likely to adhere to those and Dr. Schwamm only had to record his voice for 20 minutes in a studio once and now anything written he wants to go to the patient can have an avatar and his voice or her voice and be really compelling. At the same time, all of us are going to be bombarded. We know this for a fact in election season with deep faked, completely fabricated imagery. You know, Joe Biden saying this, Trump saying that in their voice, with their face. So this seeing is believing thing is going to, I think, really start to erode. Yeah. And I think trust in general, trust in information, Trust is going to be the big commodity. Right now, healthcare uh, systems probably hold the greatest share of trust left yeah. in institutions in this country. And we have to really protect that trust because that is our differentiating brand. So we have to be really careful that we don't have these rogue events happen with well-crafted AI that's 
meant to do the right thing, but yeah. someone's having a heart attack during the call and it just keeps asking him to answer the last question. Like we, we got, we got to get this right. Yeah, that, that, that's wonderfully said. Uh, uh, sorry, just before we get off the topic of shovel ready, anything else that you guys are thinking about an in basket example is fantastic. Uh, anything else that's coming top of mind that, you know, teams are thinking about uh, and or prioritizing? Yeah, you guys have so much going on just outside of AI that you're prioritizing as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, on the AI front, I think there's, uh, we're also doing a lot of work in partnership. The in-basket example is actually homegrown, but we're doing a lot of work in partnership. Uh, Lee mentioned the, um, you know, sort of around documentation and charting support. Like we're doing quite a lot there. We're actually, I believe, the uh, single biggest um, deployment of DAX um, with Nuance um, and ambient listening in the country. So, um, you know, testing uh, and, you know, working on getting that deployed across our system uh, to support our clinicians, that's a big priority. We're doing... Um, we're doing some work uh, piloting uh, solutions around virtual assistants for like knowledge workers as well, like productivity tools, basic stuff like that, that just, you know, sort of, it becomes over time, we take it, you know, we take it for granted, those types of things, like we all have a smartphone, we're all going to have our little co-pilots right alongside us, um, helping us draft emails and summarize things, like we're doing some work in that. Um, and then an, a really interesting example that we've started to do some experimentation with is actually like sort of on the notion of empathy mm. and delivering empathic messages through um, through like that are that are generated through um, uh, an LLM. And we have tried we have actually provided empathic generative responses to our patients, um, especially when we can't um, fulfill a, a self-service response or a self-service request, but we can say, well, I'm really sorry, you know, um, that X, Y, Z happened. I can't answer that question for you, but maybe if, you know, you like this number for X, Y, Z could, if you call this number, they can help you, you know, sort of like closing the loop in an empathic way. Service recovery. Um, Another early, really, really early kind of test that we're doing is actually with um, like, you know, clinicians when they get burned out sometimes can't be particularly sensitive or empathic and helping folks deliver difficult mm -hmm. news or be empathic in a patient care uh, moment. It's not about the clinical piece of it, clinical side of it. It's really about the patient interaction really? side. And so we've started to do some interesting experimentation led by um, one of our clinicians who's actually in our Institute for Human Caring. So very, we're getting pretty creative with it and like learning a lot of interesting um, things through these endeavors. And then, you know, like like Lee said, you know, the back office stuff is um, table stakes. We just got to do it, take out overhead, take, you know, like make it like more efficient, help our, our people be more productive. So one of the things, Missy, that, that, uh, that we've been Sometimes you have to get the ground ready for the shovel, not the other way around. And so we've been spending a lot of time thinking about the how to create a secure aggregation of identified and de-identified data into structured data models. We're part of Cosmos, which is a big yep. epic, uh, you know, collaborative that that uses the epic data model. Um, but we're also looking at several other uh, vendors and really asking ourselves how do we want to transform our existing data so that we can start to both build our own and validate our own algorithms, join uh, you know, AMC partners in creating these federated networks, um, thinking really, trying to really think like where the puck is going here. We're gonna be trying to build these relationships with payers, with other AMCs, with industry, with new healthcare entrants. There's no question that data is the new oil, right? It is what's gonna power this economy and highly curated, high quality data will be what everybody wants. And so finding that right balance of true de-identification and privacy preserving is one of the frontiers where, you know, clever entrants will make billions for themselves yes. because there's so much stuff that can be re-identified yeah. that you really have to process and put stuff in the blender and take it out again in a way that and really can't be reversed. Each, if you nail that, each institution can even monetize and in the spirit of, you know, of, of sort of like what, what, what Kaiser Permanente was doing a decade ago on adverse income, adverse events, you know, like 
mining your overall data and being like, hey, we're going to figure out an adverse event with a particular drug before it even happens. I know in my early days at Google, like as much as people would say Google was the big brother, or Google was, didn't have their heart in the right place. I mean, Google did want to figure out how to mine data and do sort of like a goodwill prediction. So I think it's an interesting concept to think about how institutions that have access to bulks of data that can figure out how to do de-identification in perpetuity, right? And, and, and that people can't kind of put those pieces back together. There's a whole sort of interesting data monetization strategy there. I think the other thing that I wanted to bring up is that we're just in the early days of large language models and that's all, that's all text-based data. There's a ton of unstructured data that no one's even touched yet. I mean, radiology, genomic, I mean, it's just unbelievable amounts of data that's not even in this yet. So maybe just a, a couple pieces from you all around where you think this could go in the future when we're adding, right, unstructured data in. And I think just one quick comment, because we haven't touched on edge computing yet. Yeah. But I think as we think about unstructured data, ideally, we want to transform on the way in, not take it all in and then transform it. So I think, um, you know, ambient, we have ambient listening now, right, with, with uh, Bridge and, and DAX and all that and the other vendors, but ambient visual information, ambient other types of information are going to be, I think, really important. And I'll tell you, um, uh, tele sitting is, you know, again, it's a, it's a shovel ready application. Just put a sitter in a, in a bunker and let them watch 12 people at a time instead of putting them one on one in a room. It's a money saver. You know, everybody, all the vendors are starting to turn that out. What's going to be the next massive exponential leap in that space is going to be the camera is on 24 seven, but there's nobody watching it. Right. The algorithms are computing on the edge there and then they're sending alerts that have you then turn the screen on and take a look. And then everyone is monitored. It's not just the person you think is going to have an adverse event, it's the person you don't expect to have the fall with injury. Yeah. And so I think um, this, this tsunami of data, these terabytes of data that are part of what we call the exposome, it's all the stuff other than our genes and the interventions that we provide, we got to figure out how to transduce that, shrink it, transform it, and then make it actionable. And so there's going to be, I think, a, a market that starts to mature very quickly around that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's super interesting to think about. I, I think this brings up what Sarah has brought up many times, which is cost. I mean, we could have tons of data, right? And, and the larger your language model gets or the larger your data set gets, the more expensive it is to, you know, you have to, you have to run your own rigs. I mean, it's a huge amount of money. And when you think about 12 cents or you think about 30 cents, uh, you know, this is the new, what I would call API tiered structure of, of, of data consumption. And I, I think no one is really talking about that right now because all the big uh, tech companies like the Amazons and the Googles of the world just really want to sort of be at the top of the pack. They want to, they want to be able to set the price um, and they want the platform. So they're willing to go way down on price uh, to be able to actually create the market. Uh, how are you guys thinking about this? Your systems, health systems, IDNs, academic medical centers are super underwater right now. Um, we're coming out of COVID. We've got labor shortages. It is a tough time. I know me being at Redesign for the last three and a half years and also being on the board of several companies that are baby seed stage into series A and B, everybody's trying to sell you guys, right? And um, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough time now. So how do you balance investing in this new wave of technology, thinking about how costs could be astronomical, with also just having to do your bread and butter stuff around what's happening, you know, with your budgets. Sarah, why don't you go first? I'll I'll answer, and then I we might we may have to wrap this up. I think we're almost at the end of yeah, our hour. I, I think what we need to do is experiment in a measured way on things that um, that are shovel ready. Like we can't just throw spaghetti at the wall. And, um, and I was having this conversation with our chief data officer, actually, where he was bringing up the fact that we're going to start seeing those incremental costs associated with, um, associated with our um, consumption of not just cloud, because we've been paying for cloud, but for the consumption of these new models. And, um, and uh, we don't really have a mechanism to handle it right now. Because um, 
those our approach has been to um, let the hyperscalers build the LLMs and we use our data to tune them. So we're reliant on them in some case, right? In some ways. And, and so we're mitigating, we're balancing the value that we can get um, while also mitigating the potential downside, which includes risk, which includes um, the incremental cost and sort of seeing how it plays out, but going deep in one or two really like meaningful places so that we start to uncover some of this stuff. So I, I, there's never anything Sarah says that I don't agree with. So I agree, <laughs> and this is no exception. Um, I think uh, we're all doing the same thing. We're picking the financial and the quality pain points and trying to tag those first. There is a risk that all this adoption is just economically driven as opposed to going for the greatest possible quality adjusted life years for patients that that doesn't get you out of financial, you know, uh, being underwater. So we got to be really careful on that. The other thing is another area for real innovation opportunity here is, you know, you don't have to drive your Hummer to the supermarket. You might want to drive it into battle. So <laughs> solutions that blend LLM access on a token based, you know, kind of uh, GPU access utility model with smaller medium language models that are right. on-prem and homegrown or that use alternative methods yeah. for you know machine learning algorithms and things that are cheap to run that's where like it's like the power grid you know when you need power you draw it off the grid when you got sunshine you don't need it you store it or you sell it back to the grid i think this federated computing and aggregate like almost like task aggregators you have a set of tasks that need to be done. You send it at the aggregator. The aggregator figures out how to batch it, batch it with others who need the GPU, re deconstruct the ones that don't need the GPU, reassemble it, send it back to you. That, that's going to be where we'll drive some real cost efficiencies. Because we can't just, the, the vendors want you to push everything, like Sarah said, push every message at the GPU. So chat GPT-4 can give you an answer. You don't need that. Yeah. Use it where you need it. So someone who can figure out how to parse things, batch things, and run stuff overnight, or run, you know, run your laundry when it's cheaper, you know, per kilowatt. That's that's where we need to gonna have to invest some some work, I think. Yeah, I love it. We could talk for hours about this. I'm glad that we ended on cost. I think it's a, a, a realistic thing. Um, this is going to be sort of an ongoing series uh, that we're gonna be breaking down healthcare, and we're really um, excited to to be working with uh, Slice on this today. I want to thank my guests, Lee and Sara. Hope to have you guys back. We just tipped the sphere of this discussion. This could go on for hours and it will. We'll be back soon to continue the discussion. Thank you both for your time today. Great seeing you.